morning. Welcome to the Board of Liquor License Commissioners for Baltimore City's morning docket. Today is Thursday, December 6th. There will be two sets of cases, a remand transcript and evidentiary review cases and regular items. When your case is called, please step up to the microphone and state your name clearly. Uh, so we have a court reporter here who will record that information. If you're going to be providing testimony, please be prepared to be sworn in. Mr. Chair, I have some preliminary matters. Please. Uh, Donald Higdon, Anthony Scardinia Jr., and Anthony Scardinia III, Higgies LLC. This case has been postponed. Rosa Fiera and Silvia Garcia, Olivia Incorporated, trading as Los Amigos, 5506 Hartford Road. This case has been postponed. Mr. Chair, may I call out of order uh, a couple of the transfer cases? Yes, please. Calling the first case. Derek Young and Cheryl Hicks, D's Sports Bar LLC, trading as D's Sports Bar, 45 North Crescent Street. This is an application to transfer a Class D beer, wine, and liquor license. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. For the sound record, David F. Nister, Mr. Winter, and Bartlett representing the applicants. Good morning. Uh, would you folks raise your right hands, please? Swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. yes. Mr. Mister. Good morning. This is an application for transfer of an existing Class D six-day license. Um, there had been a substitute application where we uh, substituted the principal of the secured creditor landlord on the license. Uh, since that time, we've been able to identify an appropriate tenant, Mr. Young and D Sport Bar, um, and uh, we would ask the board, obviously, to consider their application today. Uh, I'd like to start with Mr. Young. Mr. Young, tell the board something about your background, what you've been doing for a living in recent years. Before you do that, where is uh, Crescent Street? Crescent is off of 40. Okay. It's considered Highland Town. Highland Town. Okay. Um, how you doing, um, good, good morning. Um, actually, I'm a previous military police in the, in the Navy. Mm -hmm. um, I have my LEOSA, um, part-time. I do executive protection on the United States. Um, I actually work for the DOD, um, up top seat clearance, and um, I want to do this, do this business. And um, what brings you into the sports bar business? Well, I had a bar already. I was operating in um, Chicago. Um, when I was um, stationed out there and um, had one in the county of Baltimore. And um, it's time for me to kind of all these side jobs try to. Did you have on. any difficulties with your uh, regulators when you ran these places in Chicago and Baltimore no, County? Not at all. And how many people did you employ? Um, Chicago, I employed four people. And here? Uh, Baltimore County, um, three. Okay. And so are you uh, alcohol certified, sir? Yes, I am. And will your staff be? Well, in, ba in Baltimore City, I'm going to be the only one running this the only one small, running? small, okay. yes. And is this Ms. Hicks? Yes, yes. Is she your resident on the license, or is she going to be active in She's the... She's a resident. She's not going to be an active <coughs> operator. Uh, okay. Um, okay. And uh, so how many years of experience do you have? In the bar business? Yeah. About 10. 10 years. Okay. Okay. And you're familiar with our rules and regulations? Yes, I am. Okay, so, you know, the people get in trouble most often for sales to minors, keep not keeping their records correctly, right. the wrong kind of purchases, unless, the, you know, the list of wholesalers and whatever. So make sure that you're uh, on top of all that. Do the commissioners have questions? Just for the record, there's no live entertainment, correct? That's correct. I think initially the application had listed that in error, and we corrected that by communication with Mr. Akris. Uh, I think it was also originally listed as a B, and we corrected that. Uh, I apologize for that. I think that was my, my client put that on there, and I didn't detect it. So it's ultimately my error. But we corrected it. Oh, well, you're getting old. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Not getting is the I'm there. I get to say that because Mr. Mister and I were classmates in law school. <laughs> the record. But I, I actually um, you're old. <laughs> <laughs> I actually applied for I did I applied for a live entertainment license. You have applied, but you yes. but the, you you can't get it until you've been approved. Okay, okay. okay. So okay. you'll be back at some point. I'll be back at some point. I have one question, Mr. Mister. Can, can you speak to um, the?
The application that was submitted notes that the day, the last day of, of operation was March of 17. So I'm curious as to ensure that the license is still valid. The license is still valid uh, because we did a substitute application in intervening time. And uh, at, I believe there had been, I have to look back through my notes, whether there had been a request for a hardship extension. I can't speak to that at the moment. But it was my understanding at the time. According to this note that Mr. Akris provided us, or someone did, that the transfer application was filed in August of this year within 180 days okay. after right. closure. All right. All right. So and that, that was the other thing, too. We just had a little bit of problem for whatever, getting everything together to, uh, to uh, get the, the, uh, the uh, advertising done and to, to get in for our hearing. But it has Thank you. Any for quite a while. Mr. Young, tell them a little bit, though, about who you expect to be a large percentage of your clientele because of your Masonic. Uh, relationship and also because of your background as, as a law enforcement officer. What happened? Um, well, mostly mostly um, retired law enforcement officers, of course, and um, basically the neighborhood. I want to make this a neighborhood comfortable bar, and um, I cleaned up the neighborhood a lot um, because of, of my ties with the um, certain organizations. I uh, make sure I had patrols. A lot of the abandoned cars that was on the street is, was towed. Neighbors neighbors felt comfortable. Um, I talked to the councilmen in the area. They've been to the bar a couple of times. So I think it should be a good thing. A number of your Masonic brothers are law enforcement officers. Is that not correct? That's right. And you expect them to be regular patrons oh, yeah. of your establishment? They definitely will be. Presumably that will help to keep control of the, uh, uh, the, the, the bad elements as well as to make sure underage people aren't being served, correct? Yeah, correct. And we, we encourage you to uh, be in contact with your local community organizations yes. to uh, make sure that uh, they are satisfied that things are operating smoothly. No problem. I, I'll do that. Okay. Um, anything further? Nothing further. All right. On the basis, then, of the materials contained in the application, the proffers from council, and the testimony received, I'd vote to approve the transfer. I concur and vote to approve the transfer. I, too, vote to approve the transfer. Good luck, sir. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. You, too. Mr. Mister. Yes. Thank you. No exhibits for the record. Calling the next case, Joseph Healy, Neal O'Donnell, Life of Riley Incorporated, trading as Riley, sorry, Life of Riley Irish Pub and Restaurant, 2031 East Fairmount Avenue. There's a Class B beer wine liquor license, a request for a hardship extension under the provisions of the Alcoholic Beverages Article 12-2202. Those who are. Thank you. Thank you. You don't have to say it's mine. Pronounced <laughs> I'm actually not going to attempt. I'm part Thank Italian. You. I don't know if I can pronounce that. Okay. Um, <coughs> would you each raise your right hand, please? Uh, do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Mr. Healy? Yes. Right. So you've uh, filed a request for hardship extension. You want to explain? Yes. I, I gave you the document so that I could first sort of tell you who we are. Okay. Or, sh or show you who we are. Uh, we've been in Butchers Hill for, on December 1st, 12 years. Um, we've, the, the first page, it was uh, part of the Butchers Hill Association home tour. We always advertised in it, and that was the 2006 edition. If you go on the next page, it just shows a little bit about the community. We've had happy hours for the Commodore Barry school teachers. We, we were very involved in the Butchers Hill community. We always have been. Um, the next page is just events, fundraisers, things we've done uh, for, for Barks, uh, the, the Pizza Duke Valentine's Day fundraiser. We've done fundraisers for Breast Cancer Awareness for Johns Hopkins. We're, we're, we're extremely involved. Next page is St. Patrick's Day. Uh, you'll see our food specials on the next page. There was an outdoor seating proposal that was actually brought to bear by Butchers Hill, and that's on the page after the food specials. That's an actual rendering of the, the patio that would have gone in, into the uh, park at Castle Street Park. As 2017 came to a close, we sort of ran into a, a couple roadblocks. It was, it was the cost of rent to do that patio, and et cetera, so it, it did not come to fruition. On the next page is a mural rendering that also, also was approved by Butchers Hill. We're, the whole point in all of this is we're very involved in the Butchers Hill community. We um, had a break-in um, at the end of January, and they stole all of our computer systems. They stole our cash registers, smashed them on the ground to try to break them open. 
took whatever they could t take. So we temporarily closed. We have been sporadically open since, but on a cash basis, and it's just not, not working. So we did everything we did, the due diligence, to get our liquor license in place, which that letter is the letter from uh, Doug Page saying, hey, your liquor license is ready. Come pick it up. My wife went in to pick it up on May 14th. She's a very honest woman. She said, we're closed. They said, well, you can't, you can't pick it up then. So we did, we did have a buyer sort of that was potentially in play from the neighborhood. So we thought, well, maybe we'll just wait a little bit. I finally did send a letter to uh, the board asking for a hard, hardship extension, knowing that I had 180 days to pull, pull that off. Um, I got, got it in actually the last day. What we're really asking is to allow us to pick up our license continue it for six months while we find a buyer. The very last page in there is from my broker, Nick, uh, Nicholas uh, Piscitelli. You'll see that even the people that are coming to bear, uh, for me, when I bought the place, it was a legacy already. It was Simons of Butchers Hill. Um, over the 12 years, we've become that legacy for this community. Sorry. I'm getting emotional because I'm closing the place. <coughs> um, it has been a legacy for the community, and we've had weddings there, we've had wakes there. It's, um, it's a place they expect to be sort of that, that beacon on Fairmount Avenue. We had a street light put in there, actually, because um, uh, the street was too dark in our first two years in, in operation there. Um, my lights are still on, even though I am currently closed, because I won't turn them off, because without them, there's no light on Fairmount. Uh, we're trying to find... by buyers that represent my values and will support the community the way the community deserves. That's it. Thank you. Um, and just to clarify, Mr. Akras, this extension, if we grant it, will be for? It will be uh, 180 days up to no longer than 360 mm -hmm. uh, from the date of closure. I believe date of closure was 4-30, uh, 2018. So you understand those dates? Okay. Uh, commissioners have questions? This is also a request to reopen then. <laughs> Uh, there was no request to reopen, just a hardship no. extension. Just, okay, just just, a hardship. Uh, okay. we, we have some, like I said, buyers from the neighborhood who were in play, and we wanted to remain a restaurant and bar. Anything? <coughs> can, can no. Okay, thank you. Um, on the basis then of your written request and the other materials contained, uh, the exhibits you provided and your testimony, I would vote to approve the hardship extension. I concur and vote to approve the hardship extension. I join my colleagues and vote to approve the hardship extension. And on a personal note, I. Feel, feel your pain. Um, I know the Ambroses are our patrons. Coach Rob Ambrose is a good friend. Very so, good friend um, of mine, too. Yeah. Uh, oh, I wasn't sure if you wanted Councilwoman yeah. Sneed to. Yeah, sure, if you'd like I to. I have nothing to add other than I stand behind him 120%. Uh, They've been so supportive of the community um, to myself personally, so I wouldn't spend my time right now than right here. So. Thank you, guys. Well, I hope it all turns out successfully. Thank you very much for your testimony. Yes, I close it for the record. I see exhibit one, exhibit package. I see exhibit two, two letters of support. I see exhibit three, 2018 renewal letter. Thank you. Ready, Bryson? Yes. Calling the next case, <clears throat> Brian Grace and Paul Dunshaw, Fireball, <clears throat> pardon me, Entertainment Incorporated, trading as the Big Easy Cabaret, 2000 East Eastern <coughs> Avenue. It's a Class D beer, wine, and liquor license. Ran to the Circuit Court of Baltimore City as per an order by the Court of Special Appeals dated September 27, 2017 with instructions to vacate the order of the Board of Liquor License Commissioners for Baltimore City and to remand to the Board of Liquor License Commissioners for Baltimore City to make specific findings of facts and a decision regarding the protest of renewal of the establishment's Class D beer, wine, and liquor license. Good morning. Would counsel identify themselves for the record, please? Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Peter Previs. Um, I am here on behalf of the landlord, Dennis Danielchik, D-A-N-I-E-L-C-Y-Z, uh, principal of IDGAF, IDGAF LLC, which is the landlord of 2000 Eastern Avenue. Uh, this premises have been closed for 
at least two years, if not three. Um, Mr. Grace, the principal of F Fireball Entertainment, Inc., uh, has surrendered the lease premises and surrendered the collateral of the premises upon closure of the business. Uh, if um, the applicants at that time were Brian Grace and Haley Taggart, um, if I can just give you a, 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 a brief opening before you present before what you, you do. Before you go on and on, can we have Ms. Witt identify herself for the Absolutely, record? I'm sorry. Becky Witt on behalf of the Fells Prospect Community Association. Okay. Uh, are you heading down the road to tell us that this issue is moot? Almost. 99 percent. Okay. What I, what I was <laughs> going to ask, what request of the board is that the any any rights to that license go to Mr. Danielchik's um, LLC. The premises is currently under, it, it's not a signed contract, but there's an MO, a um, letter of intent to sell the premises to a new owner who intends to open a coffee establishment, not a liquor license establishment, and certainly not an adult entertainment establishment. The request would be to renew the license for the purpose of a secure creditor substitute application for the purpose of attempting to transfer the license to another location. It's very different from the issue that was before the court. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm not quite sure. I mean, we were prepared to proceed on the remand of the issue that was before uh, the board back in, um, what was it, when were they first here? 2000. April 2015. I think it was April 23rd, 2015. Yeah. Right. But so I guess my question to both of you is, would it be of any practical use for us to do that? Yes. <laughs> I, I believe Because you don't so. want them to be able to transfer it to a new location. Yes. But you don't even know where they want to transfer it, right? Well, I think... <laughs> um, this gets tricky, and I don't know to what extent the board is prepared to accept any new evidence or clarifying evidence at this hearing. Well, I'll, I'll tell you how we had intended to okay. proceed. And I didn't mean to cut you off as previously. No, so. I just so this is. I thought that my statements might simplify things. As it may or may not, I don't know. So um, this comes before us in an unusual posture in that it was heard by a board, none of the members of which are currently on the board. So. Um, we decided that we would be um, uh, governed or uh, educated a bit by Judge Moylan's uh, decision in People's Council for Baltimore County versus County Ridge Shopping Center, which is a case cited at 144 Maryland App 580 from 2002, mm -hmm. uh, where there he sets out um, acceptable remand procedures mm -hmm. for a new board. And the bottom line of this case, rather than read it all to you, and you may be familiar with it, is that uh, the Court of Special Appeals says the general rule is that it is enough if those who decide have considered and appraised the evidence and the courts feel more satisfied that they have done so if they have heard argument. So each of the commissioners here has reviewed the transcript of the proceeding before Judge Ward's board um, and is prepared to um, discuss it with you. Uh, for my own sake, it would be helpful um, if rather than you argue at us if you answer some of our questions about it because none of us were here. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and you were both here, right? Yes. I believe so. Okay. Um, so if it's all right with you, I'll begin. Okay. Um, so in reviewing the record, it seemed to me, first of all, that the, um, the time period that was in question before the board on the renewal was from May 14th of the previous year to April 15th of the current year when it came in. But uh, Judge Ward didn't permit evidence on that time period. He uh, would only hear from the time that they had heard a violation hearing in November until the renewal hearing. Um, and then uh, a number of issues were discussed before the board um, and in no particular order. So um, Ms. Witt raised a challenge to the residency uh, of the applicants on the um, the request for renewal, and there was some discussion about whether or not material misstatements were made to the board um, with respect to that. Um, you're, I think, were you representing the Mr. Grayson's people at the time? Yes, yes. So your clients had indicated to the board that while they at some point recognized they didn't have a proper resident, they hoped to give some 
interest in it to one of the dancers at the club at some point so that there would be a, 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 an appropriate resident on the application, but that had not happened at the time. It was before the board. Not, not in evidence, but, but the- You the, said that the you were going to, but, but it had not yet occurred. No, I, if I recall, it's been a while, but the, the renewal application for the applicable year was amended and filed, and it indicated Brian Grace and Haley Taggart, H-A-L-E-Y-T-A-G-G-A-R-T, who- Be At the time of the hearing? <coughs> it had been filed prior to the hearing. The issue, I believe, with um, uh, one of the commissioners was the statute indicated that that person needed to be an officer and, and on the renewal application. I don't know that Ms. Taggart was specifically- She was going to be a shareholder, right? As, yeah, as an officer, and that would have had to have been amended. But Ms. Taggart was at the hearing, and the-, the, the She never testified, did she? No. I don't think she was at the hearing of- but, it, but regardless, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. No, go ahead. What I, what I don't, but, but that, transfer, that transfer hadn't occurred at the time that the previous board took up this protest of renewal. Is that accurate? You were authorized to substitute corporate officers or licensees at renewal time. But you hadn't so done it yet, I don't believe. I had filed it. Absolutely. But I the, absolutely had but filed the board it. But the board hadn't approved that at that hearing, though, right? I'm, tr I'm trying to figure out, because uh, what I'm hearing you say, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the transfer had already been effectuated by the time the protest of renewal occurred. No. Okay. Let, let me provide a hypothetical without a renewal protest. Okay. Um, it comes renewal time, and the licensed premises is requesting to change one of the licensees because the one licensee moved to Anne Arundel County. So on the, um, that current year's renewal application, you would file with the new person's name, provide a copy of a fingerprint notice, provide a corporate resolution authorizing the substitution, and if the, if the outgoing licensee is cooperative, a letter from the outgoing licensee saying, I hereby resign, I no longer live in Baltimore City. And that would be considered up upon approving the renewal application. So that was what was done. Now, there is a protest of renewal in the midst of that. So, w which I don't think other than that case, I ever had the two things going on simultaneously. So, but th they, they did find a Baltimore City resident. Mr. Gunshaw had lived in South Baltimore and had moved to, to Millersville, um, and on the prior, prior year's application had indicated that he still lived in South Baltimore. But correct me if I'm wrong, because it seems, it, my review of this is um, that the, the board was searching for a specific complaint upon which to determine whether renewal was appropriate. And this issue arose in the context of whether or not there had been a material misstatement by your clients, which may have given the board a specific complaint. Um, so that's one issue that would have given the board the authority to deny a renewal if they found that. The other one that they seemed to focus on was the incident that occurred uh, and was heard on violation on November 20 of the year before when there had been a fight on the, at the premises and there were two rule violations that were found at that time. But I'm advised that subsequently, subsequently one of those was reversed. Correct. Um, By Judge and Fletcher Hill? I guess before the renewal hearing? Just before, like yeah. a couple days before, yeah. So the failure to cooperate violation was upheld, and if the board had articulated it, Perhaps they could have said that that was a specific complaint on a given date uh, upon which they ruled. Mm -hmm. The transcript is doesn't have much in it that we can grasp at except inferences. Mm -hmm. There's a lots of other talk in the record, something about MOU violations, but there's no dis that's n never followed up on. Mm -hmm. um, and um, this rule 
3.02 cooperation violation um, was never discussed. And it, I don't even believe it appears in your list of things in your application or your opposition to the renewal. Because I think you were more focused on the welfare, general welfare one that mm -hmm. we, the board couldn't base it on mm -hmm. having been reversed. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a mess. <laughs> yeah. um, and um, I'm happy to absolutely hear how my colleagues feel about this, but um, I'm a little uncomfortable with um, on my review of the transcript and getting the issues in proper focus, saying that there was an appropriate ruling on a specific complaint that would entitle them to not renew. Um, but I'm Can willing, I yeah, respond sure. to a few things? Um, so certainly part of the argument at the time was based on the fact that Mr. Gunshaw had moved away from Baltimore City but had continued to list Baltimore City as his residency for the purposes of more than one renewal application, um, which I believe, and this is all kind of based on our, <laughs> our memories, so it's, it's a little bit difficult now to remember, but I believe those substitute licensees were only submitted after um, Mr. Grace realized that the community was going to bring an, a concern about Mr. Gunshaw's residency. Um, so they were hurriedly submitted right before the hearing specifically to kind of co-opt that argument, um, is, is my recollection anyway. Um, and at that, because it was submitted rather hurriedly, I don't believe that any financial interest in the business had actually been transferred to Ms. Taggart. And, um, and I know that she was not an officer of the corporation at the time of the hearing. Let me ask you, because I'm, I'm, I'm looking at what Judge Ward said on the mm -hmm. record, okay? So he said, uh, time for decision, um, I vote first. The decision is I vote that the license shall not be renewed because I adopt Ms. I assume it's Witt. Yeah. It's not in the, uh, it doesn't say in the transcript. Your argument with respect to the legality of the renewal of the license, which I find that it has not been properly renewed. What does that mean? And then the license is a nullity and at the present time. What does any of that mean? It's a good question. Um, I, th I think he's saying that the people who are on the license are, as of the time of the hearing, not qualified to hold the license. So he goes on, he says, therefore, since it has not complied, it being, I don't know what, with the city law with respect to the liquor board, mm -hmm. I don't know what that is, and the city law with respect to liquor license approvals, it can't be renewed. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I think that that is what he meant, that the people who were on the renewal license Mr. Grace alone can't hold the liquor license because I he's guess not here's resident. my problem, and s tell me what you think. It would be one thing to say that uh, technically it can't be renewed because um, uh, they don't have a proper applicant. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would be another thing, you argued, that there was uh, a material misrepresentation which would be a violation mm -hmm. in a specific complaint. Mm -hmm. But he never says anything about that mm -hmm. in his decision. Mm -hmm. So where does that leave us? Um, with respect to, uh, you brought up the um, public health and welfare kind of arguments that kind of predominated. But that was with respect to the 1120 event at the place, right? Um, mostly, but certainly there was um, complaints from other residents who talked about noise and who talked about um, constant disruptions to the neighborhood. And there was the fact the, that, that the same issue we often get to is they didn't give a time, mm -hmm. place, date, and whatever upon which to hang one's hat. Yeah. Um, not to mention, I'm sorry, not to mention the place had been closed for a period of time. It was closed for so two months, I believe. Yeah. Um, the where was I going to try? So another thing that came up was that the um, Mr. Grace, as it says. Um, clearly in the transcript was not someone who was capable of being on premises almost at all because he lived on the Eastern Shore, worked full-time in DC as a firefighter, 
Um, and so he hired a manager who we did, we talked about a little well, bit in the transcript. That. And Commissioner was uh, Moore was very upset about the absentee owner mm -hmm. and the fact that the manager they hired turned out to be not a very reputable character. Yes. And he had gotten in subsequent trouble. He had been uh, arrested for, for drug. And there's uh, some of those records are actually in, I mean, documents are actually in the record, but no one discusses them in any particularity at you the hearing. You mean the commissioners don't discuss right. them? I uh -huh. don't think you all actually. I mean, no one pulled out the, I don't believe, the um, arrest records and other things and questioned any witnesses about anything at the hearing. I, I don't, I didn't see it. There's, there's been many hearings about this <laughs> establishment, so it's hard for me to remember specifically this one because there was another one about the adult entertainment license where uh, we went into a lot of detail with the arrest records, so I don't remember. Well, was, honestly, the bottom line, was there any evidence that this Mr. Mariano or whatever it was in this record, any evidence that he was doing this at this location at any specific time? In that record, there was not evidence at the, because he had been, he was still under some investigation and had not been charged. I have that evidence if you would like to see it. I don't think we're authorized to take new evidence. Well, That's the problem. I believe in People's Council, weren't there four different options that the board could have done? And the third one being, if the record was incomplete, the board could have supplemented with additional argument or evidence. But we have to then say that the original board decision was correct because of something it didn't hear. Uh, no, I don't think so. looking back in time, and we're not making a new decision. Well, doesn't, but People's Council says you're allowed to clarify an earlier rationale, make a de novo policy decision, supplement the record, or proceed de novo, correct? I understand, but so, and I don't mean to argue with you, but <laughs> uh, if, uh, my understanding of what particularly Commissioner Moore was upset about was, she knew he had been arrested, she thought he was um, the wrong person by far to be managing this place, mm -hmm. and that the owners had let him do it because they didn't want to be here. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't see anywhere in there where she went off on any specifics about his offense or where his offense occurred. Because I wasn't here at this point, there was some he was arrested on the road somewhere. Yeah, he was arrested in was Maryland, searched. but not nearby. The bar was searched. Um, and at that time, we were unclear whether or not he had actually been distributing drugs from within the bar or somewhere else. ATF had come in. Mm -hmm. and raided the bar, they and that was about the, but you didn't have any results from that at the time, I don't believe. Not at that time. Well, commissioners, what do you all think? Commissioner Hafey has actually seen those, those results from the raid because of the um, adult entertainment protest of renewal where they were presented, um, but that was. And that license is gone. Yeah, that's gone, right, yeah. so it's so not that was Hafey, but I'm sorry. You go ahead. You, you participated in the remand hearing of right. that. And right. then it went to the circuit court and then to the Court of Special Appeals where it was the, the non-renewal was affirmed and no further action was taken. So in that record, there is some evidence. There is. Right. There's, right. yeah, that evidence of what took place in the bar. Well, what do you all want to do? So I guess the issue before us is Ms. Witt's is, if I'm hearing correctly, whether we take new evidence, but you, Mr. Chairman, are you suggesting that that's not the way for this further proceeding? I, I think we have to base it on what's before us. Right, I would agree. Um, the transcript before us, and while I may have been a participant on the subsequent, in the subsequent hearings, that's not before us in this transcript, and furthermore, that license is invalid, is that? But, yeah, sorry. Go ahead, but you can make your the, argument. Um, that license is dead, but that decision was based on the same time period um, and the same set of incidents. It's just that there was more information that was available at that subsequent hearing because that occurred in January 2016 when some additional evidence was made available due to Mr. Mariano's um, subsequent guilty plea for, for distributing cocaine. I mean, it seems to me that the uh, what the higher court, what the courts wanted this board to do, was to go back and search the record, and to determine whether there was substantial evidence in the record to support the non-renewal that was the decision of the board. 
Um, we have that coming up in the case right after this as well, where we ourselves apparently didn't articulate well enough our basis. Um, so, um, you know, I'll let you make whatever argument you want to make. And no, I mean, I don't have a more involved argument than the fact that under number three in the People's Council case. Right, me too, where you are in that case. Uh, sure, I guess it's um, the Penn site. Page 594 in the that. appeals. Because you see, you're back. If you go to 596, mm -hmm. that's where he starts talking about remand procedures by an unchanged board. Right. And then after that, at um, Um, when you get to around 603, the case law on changes in membership, um, and it, what makes this case tricky is we have an entirely changed composition of the board. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think the rules he suggests for an unchanged board apply to us. Mm -hmm. um, that's why his general rule that um, we're to appraise the record for evidence and allow argument, I thought was a reasonable resolution. And I do, I, I'm, a, I'm fond of Judge Moylan because I had his seat for a while. <laughs> uh, but I mean, he's also very clear most of the time on mm -hmm. what he um, is setting out. So I don't think, I, w I don't think we're entitled to, but if you want to put proffers into the record, so if this goes up again, uh, you're welcome to do that. Well, is this case going to keep going? <laughs> I don't know. It seems to be there's not much left of it, except for this opportunity to renew it and allow them to transfer it to a different location. Seems unlikely this board would allow it to reopen where it is. Mm -hmm. And we would consent on the record that it be moved to another location. I'd like to just, I'd like to, if I can, oh. um, provide some details That's about. Fine. And we've kind of gone over this, um, so Mr. Priebus is familiar with it. I only have two copies. I'll let Sorry. my colleagues have okay. I'll share. Have, can have I'll share. Sorry. Okay, so um, there are, this is the affidavit in support of the search and seizure warrant that was executed on several properties with respect to Mr. You're offering all this in evidence, is that yes, correct? Yes, please. Uh, yeah. To the extent that we decide whether or not we're going to take it, mm -hmm. I'll mark it for identification. Okay. It'll be part of the record. Whether it comes into evidence is another issue. Okay. And I'll note an objection for the record. That's fine. I will try to go through it as quickly as possible. M most of it does not have to do with the Big Easy at all, um, it, but I'll point out the places where it does. Um, page seven just notes that one of the subject, loca subject locations to be searched is 2000 Eastern Avenue because of the time that Mr. Mariano, again, the, the manager that Mr. Grace had hired to run the business full time without much um, supervision, he spent a lot of his time at the Big Easy. Um, then I'll skip forward to page 54. He um, spent some time with some confidential informants on number 170 there in the middle of the page. Um, meeting at the bar to discuss, there's, there's quite a few transactions of um, uh, sales of cocaine and heroin at various points during during this um, What's the time period investigation. This? So this is during the license year that we protested. This is 2014 to 2015. Um, so there's discussions happening at the bar. Um, I guess I, sorry, I did this out of order. Can you go back to page 30? There's um, a discussion of the fight that occurred at the, which was the subject of the November hearing, the violation hearing, um, that was on appeal overturned, but based on there wasn't enough evidence that there was a public health and safety issue. Um, but there's a conversation between Mr. Mariano and the two confidential informants about the fight. At the hearing, Mr. Mariano said there was no fight, he never saw a fight. During this conversation, which happens at the, starts at the bottom of page 30, goes all the way down page 31. It describes in a lot of detail what happened um, using a lot of slang that I won't 
read out loud um, about the fight that happened at the Big Easy. People, um, it started on the second floor, which he said he never saw and that he was there the whole time and never saw it. Um, the neighbors heard it. You can see about five lines down. The neighbors heard them fighting and called in to the police. So you can see that there was a public disturbance actually, um, even though that specific charge was overturned um, on appeal. Um, I won't go that much further into it, but on number 90 on page 31, it's the, the affiant says, based on his training knowledge and experience, um, Mr. Mariano was discussing a fight that had occurred the weekend of September 20th at Mr. Mariano's nightclub, the Big Easy Cabaret. Okay, so that's the fight. Um, the, okay, so if you skip forward to page 37, like I said, there's a lot of transactions between the confidential informants and Mr. Mariano. And at the top of page 37, they realize at some point they had overpaid him for cocaine. And so one of the informants calls Mariano and says, and tries to work this out. Um, Mariano agrees to basically refund them with three eight balls of cocaine. That's like maybe six lines down. I see it. Okay. So he says to go to the Big Easy and go into the bathroom and the cocaine will be there in the bathroom. So they go in um, and they find it and they give some money to the bartender who was also present at the hearing on November 20th and said she never saw um, any fight. So that's the one transaction that we know of that occurred inside the bar. There are other ones that happened in Patterson Park. Um, What's the date on that one? That was... Let me see. I believe it's October 7th. If you go back to the top of page uh -huh. 35, they're describing a lot of conversations that happened that day. Okay. okay. Um, and then there's another mention on page 41 where they are um, just in the bar discussing future activities. Um, Number 124, he's talking to another inform the, one of the informants, and he says he wants to renovate the nightclub, add an after-hour spot, um, sell more drugs on the second floor. Um, I will just point out, um, since we brought up Mr. Danielle Cech, that on page, sorry, I'm going to need just one second to find it. Okay, page 62, paragraph 203, it says the Big Easy Cabaret building is owned by IDGAF, which is a holding company. The president of the holding company is Dennis Danielchek. Danielchek is the resident agent um, for Fireball Entertainment, which maintains the liquor license. Between August 14th, 2014 and November 18th, 2014, Mariano and Danielchek had 435 phone contacts. So 400 phone calls in four months, um, which, you know, but in and of itself doesn't necessarily mean anything. They could have been talking about anything. Um, but that's, I guess, the main reason why um, the community would not be thrilled to have Mr. Danielle check um, maintain control of the license because they are, are concerned that he was involved to some extent. They don't know that for sure, but there's there is kind of a general concern that he may have been involved. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and he is who? He's the land. secured creditor and, and land, yes. land, landlord. Um, and just as long as I'm submitting things for the record that may or may not be considered, I have one more thing. Um, And I don't know to what extent there's any more information on this, um, but Mr. Grace, the licensee, um, in 2016 was also arrested on, on drug charges. Um, the That's after the period that was before it, the commission. It is, yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, again, I don't think it's relevant, but you can put it in for identification if you want. Okay, I will put it in, um, and I, it was in Virginia, so there's not a lot of evidence that I actually have access to, um, just a newspaper article about it. Jackson, for the record. Yeah, it, it would be marked for ID. It's not going to be received. Okay. Okay, thank you. 
Okay. Um, I understand that the board feels that it's it's constrained by um, the fact that it did not hear the original um, argument and the original set of witnesses directly. And I, I do agree that the transcript is not clear. I mean, we can't make credibility determinations, but if you read the transcript, you can see what the commissioners said was important to them. And mm -hmm. I don't see anywhere where they say, this is a specific complaint upon which I'm determining that it can't be renewed. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I narrowed it down to the two issues that I thought they were trying to grapple with, one being whether there was uh, a material misstatement on the application, and the other one whether or not the events that led to the violations on November 20 were the two specific things. Do you disagree with that? That's what it sounded to me like they were basing it on. I don't disagree with that. Um, I think I think the material misstatement was a big part of it. Um, and I then mean, Commissioner Jones says, and what I heard was, I did not know. You know, sometimes what you don't know can cause harm to others. In this case, it caused harm to the peacefulness of this community. As we have a due diligence to knowing things about the business that you're going to be a part of, I, I don't know what he's talking about. I think <laughs> I think in that section, I, I don't want to speak for Commissioner Jones, <laughs> but I, and you know he could be here to help us ex understand what what he meant. But um, is it too late? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's not, call him. <laughs> um, I think what he meant about not knowing things is that and, and just. To, to make it even more confusing, they, they had just gone through a very long and complicated violation hearing in November, which was fresh in their minds, fresh sort of in their minds. Um, so there was a lot of discussion at that hearing about whether or not Mr. Grace knew anything about what was going on and to what extent he could be held responsible if he didn't know. Or, um, and so I think that that may be what Mr. Jones was referring to because Mr. Grace, you know, lives far away, works far away, didn't know what was going on, and made a big deal about how he was going to totally but if you, change. if you were representing a client in a renewal hearing and you were on the other side and there were vague references to things that happened before, mm -hmm. you wouldn't be very happy with that as the basis when, without any specific content to them. I mean, how do you challenge that? I mean, there, there certainly was a specific incident in November he doesn't mention that, though. I mean, Commissioner Moore does. Commissioner she says, does. Um, I concur with the chairman and my fellow commissioner. I remember when you were here in November, and one of the things that struck me then, I don't have the full record, but I remember being very concerned about the absentee nature of the management. Mm -hmm. But uh, no one was charged <laughs> with any violations for that. And um, I mean, I think she thought that's what led to the problems, that and the fact that they hired a total loser to um, to manage the place. That's an alcoholic term of art. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she was upset about that. Um, let me see here. Well, I guess I would argue this. I, w I guess that I wouldn't take each commissioner's um, decision completely separately from each other because they're saying that they agree with each other. Right. So, um, but Commissioner so who we, Jones. Do we start with Judge Ward? <laughs> Commissioner, well, I mean, I he guess found I would an improvement in the operation. <laughs> yeah, I think it was just because it wasn't open. <laughs> um, when it's closed, it doesn't really have a negative impact on the community. I guess I would focus more on Commissioner Jones saying that there was an, an effect on the community. Um, when, though? I mean, I understand well, generally, I, yes. I think he's talking, uh, again, about that November incident. But he doesn't say that, and neither does the judge. He says here, I adopt all the prior testimony, but he doesn't say from when. Mm -hmm. Well, I think he's, I, I think he's referring to I do the think so too, but November it would be helpful if he had said so. <laughs> it would have been, certainly. Um, and I think Commissioner Moore is also referring to that date. Well, she does refer specifically to that to that hearing and, and um, 
but I thought we can't take that into consideration because the general welfare is out. It's just cooperation at that point. Well, there was a great deal of testimony. You know, I don't know on, maybe Mr. Priebus can enlighten us on what specifically was overturned. I wasn't part of the appeal. But, but just think about this. So I think that I'm guessing that the violation of general welfare was based upon this fight that took place on the premises under so the management of these licensees. So here's, again, this is from my memory. Um, and I wasn't even a part, you know, I wasn't representing anyone at that hearing because it was a violation hearing, but I was present. So um, at the November hearing, what the testimony that was presented was that there was a fight that happened inside and then outside the police found a gun in a car that was parked directly outside. And so really, and then there was tons of testimony from the licensee saying there was no fight inside, we don't have no idea, the fact that someone found a gun in a parked car outside of our establishment has nothing to do with us, but the community said we saw and heard a fight. So there was a lot of back and forth. I don't know, I think that the violation, the public health and safety violation had to do with the fact that the police found a gun in the car. Well, and if so that's the case, then why is Commissioner Moore talking about absentee landlords? She never mentions a gun. She doesn't mention a fight. <laughs> neither does Commissioner Jones, and neither does Judge Ward. You know, I... Well, if you were sitting over here and you had to tell the court, circuit court that there's substantial evidence in this record to support these findings, how would you articulate that? I would say there's certainly substantial evidence of a material misstatement. Um, when... Mr. Gunshaw wanted to remain on the license, or Mr. Ward wanted him to remain on the license, and they continued to submit renewal applications for the past two years, I believe, that had an, an address that he had sold. He didn't even own that property anymore. It wasn't a confusion about whether or not, you know, property ownership counted as residency, like a lot of people tend to believe. He had sold the property and moved away, and someone else had, had who lived there and owned the property. So that was a material misstatement. Yeah, let's focus on that for a second. So what we have on that is Judge Ward's comment. Mm -hmm. He doesn't refer to it as a, sp a specific complaint as fulfilling that requirement. He says uh, he adopts Ms. Witt's argument with respect to the legality <coughs> of the renewal of the license. It wasn't properly renewed and it was a nullity. And neither of the other commissioners mentions it at all. I mean, I'm just troubled. <laughs> but they say they agree. With what? <laughs> <laughs> because then they go off on talking about the other incident. Mm -hmm. I don't, we could go on all day, I suppose. I mean, I think you see the problem we have. I see the problem you have. <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, I'm satisfied that uh, I think I can make my resolution. Do the other commissioners have questions or anything you want to hear? I don't have any further questions. I, I want to make sure that uh, I'm clear on our role. I, I thought I was, um, which is to review the record um, and uh, to determine what the previous board, uh, we're trying to, I guess, assume, uh, find a basis in the record for their decision. And it's not just, but Mr. Chairman, it's not just their comments on the transcript, it's also the other um, testimony that came before them. Right. we're also looking at right. right okay i'm prepared to go forward but M may i be heard? May, no i don't want to be heard but i just want to make one comment regarding mr danielczyk's reputation oh, okay. if if the atf had been counting my phone calls i probably had an equal amount of phone calls to mr mariano during <laughs> this time period because we were extremely upset with him and he was he was there as a manager did he end up in jail i believe he, he did did i I've lost track of him, but he, I was, believe. He, he was booted before he hit that back door in that, that hearing. Uh, and I had call, calls with him. I had calls with uh, his attorney at that point. So we, we were, there were calls, but it wasn't because we were in cahoots with him. It was because we were not pleased with him. Well, I understand that. I, you know, obviously, he was a bad apple, um, to say the least whether what your client's view of it was didn't come out in the record. 
Um, I think you have different views about that. But all right. Um, so uh, for my sake, I've reviewed this record um, and I've heard arguments from counsel. And Ms. Witt's made a very uh, creative effort to try to supplement uh, the gaps in this record um, so that we would be able to sustain the uh, non-renewal findings. Um, I think I'm not able to. I, um, I just don't see any determination of a specific um, complaint during the requisite period or the, the relevant period uh, where there was a consensus among the commissioners that that was the basis for non-renewal. Um, while I can read into the record what I think they were saying, uh, I don't feel like I'm entitled to do that. So um, I would um, not um, confirm their uh, determination of non-renewal based on this record. Commissioners? Commissioner Hayden, uh, would you like me to proceed? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm taking notes. Uh, well, I approach this a little bit differently than the chairman. I think there were attempts by Ms. Witt to put forth two very specific complaints. One is the um, <coughs> public health and welfare, which I don't think was met at all in the record. I don't think there was evidence of that. Um, I do think that there was a material misrepresentation of the applications. And the basis for that, and I think that that's what um, I would infer from the finding of the commissioners, uh, specifically, um, if we look at the testimony from Mr. Grace, um, in his 2013 transfer application, um, well, let me, let me step back. Uh, I believe that his, um, the applications of Mr. Grace and Mr. Gunshaw were material misstatements, specifically, um, Page 16 to 17, with respect to Mr. Grace, he states he lives in Centerville. Page 17 to 18 in the transcript, I'm referring to the transcript, claims he stays on Hudson Street on the weekends. He actually rents a room. He is not registered to vote in Baltimore on page 19. He acknowledges he didn't realize he needed to register to vote in Baltimore. There is an effort in the transcript where there's an attempt to replace Mr. Gunshaw, which I'll get to, with Ms. Hag Taggart. Uh, who had no ownership interest in the corporation, which is required, page 24 to 30. Um, and from what I gather, the revised application was never approved or perfected by this board. Uh, as it relates to Mr. Gunshaw, he's not an officer of the corporation, which is required. His uh, 2013 transfer application says he lived in Federal Hill, but moved six months after the application to, An to Anne Arundel County. Further, 2014, he claims he still lives in Federal Hill, even though he had moved. Um, so he's not a city resident, he's not a city voter, but claimed to be on the application. To me, that's a material misstatement. Further, um, we uh, have the authority to determine on a renewal based upon current law uh, whether a licensee is qualified or not, and I would find that he clearly is not qualified. Further, the spec based upon the transcript in front of us, uh, also, with respect to our rules, um, I think, again, back to the specific complaint, Rule 4.12, it's very clear to me that this was a false statement made by the licensees. So for those reasons, I would affirm just with respect to the specific complaint of a material misrepresentation of the application. I find that uh, when we talk about a specific complaint of the operation of an establishment, I would interpret that to mean the completion of an application would it be would include the operating of your uh, establishment, especially in a renewal. So, for those reasons, I would find that uh, that the board did uh, may not have articulated it clearly, but uh, did find a specific complaint, and the material misrepresentation of the application is just that. So I have um, I have reviewed the transcript uh, before us. I've reviewed the opinion, and I've heard we've heard testimony today, and I've considered uh, 
Mr. Previs's testimony and Ms. Witt's testimony. You mean argument? Uh, excuse me, argument, not testimony. Thank you. And I, I, I disagree with uh, Commissioner. Um, I well, I, I agree with the chair. I. In the decision, I don't find a specific complaint to form the basis upon which uh, this uh, the decision was made. Uh, while I recognize Commissioner uh, Greenfield's um, uh, the points that he raised um, as to the material misrepresentation of the applicant, I'm. It, it, the decision isn't clear to me, and that was, in my opinion, what we were called to review today and to uh, ferret out. And on that basis, I do not, I'm unfortunately on this uh, transcript before us. I cannot confirm um, the opinion of the previous board. Mr. Chairman, if I could just supplement my comments with, very briefly. Sure. So since I did find a specific complaint, um, I'd also find that that is enough. The material misrepresentations are enough to revoke. Okay. Uh, so going back to the decision that from the Court of Special Appeals, which remanded the matter to the board, um, the court said, um, we can only sustain the board's decision on the findings and for the reasons stated by it, but no specific facts, findings of fact were made in this case. Uh, did the board conclude that because the proposed licensees were not statutorily qualified to hold the license, consideration of Article 2B, Section 1031A15 was unnecessary? If not, what specific complaint as to the operation of the Big Easy was the basis for non-renewal and what evidence over what time frame supported the board's decision. In short, the factual and legal basis for non-renewal of the license in light of the statutory scheme for renewal of licenses in Baltimore City is not sufficiently clear for meaningful judicial review. Um, cases remanded to the Board of Liquor License Commissioner for Baltimore City for further proceedings consistent with this opinion. Um, so my understanding of the remand order is that we were to look into the record to determine whether um, those findings of fact were made and whether there was a substantial basis in the record to support them. And our decision today is a two to one decision saying that there is not adequate record here to support the original determination by the board to uh, not renew this license for the period of, I think it was 2015, is that correct? Correct. Um, where that leaves you, I'm not sure Mr. Previs, but that's the best we can do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Do we uh, call those items into the record? I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Can you call the items that were introduced by Ms. Uh, yeah, but they are not in evidence. They are uh, marked uh, for identification and made part of the record as such in case the case goes up and she wants to use them. Okay. Item number one, um, exhibit package. Item number two, newspaper article. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Thank you. It was an interesting exercise. <laughs> Bryson? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Calling the next case, Andrew Dunlap and Michael White, the Sobo Taco Spot LLC, trading as Banditos, 1118 South Charles Street, Unit 101. It's a class BD7 beer, wine, and liquor license reversed and remanded to the Board of Liquor License Commissioners of Baltimore City for further proceedings for further findings of fact and conclusions of law and for further articulation of the evidence it relied upon to support its finding that the petitioners, quote, failed to control the incident, end quote, and thus violated Liquor Board Rules 3.12, General Welfare, and 4.16, Illegal Conduct. 
Council. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Peter Previs on behalf of the licensees with me today is Mr. Michael White, one of the licensees, and his son, Sean White, manager at Bandit. Good afternoon. Does. We're not going to be taking testimony, but just in case you speak, what, can I swear you in, <laughs> gentlemen? How do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. So, Mr. Previs, again, we've reviewed the circuit court's order, and Judge DiPietro didn't feel that we had uh, adequately articulated um, from the record um, what the basis was for our finding that the petitioners had failed to control the incident. Um, and by that, we're um, referring to this stabbing that occurred. Um, I forget what it was. It June 26, 2017. Uh, May 13th. Was it, I have the wrong date. 17. Okay, you're right. Okay. Um, and so let me begin with what I said, which was, as I review it, um, poorly stated. <laughs> um, I said with respect to the violation, so the way I read this, the violation of Rule 3.12 was charged because an incident of violence occurred on the premises and was not immediately controlled, and there were serious consequences and three innocent victims as a result. And the same is true of the Rule 416 violation. The fact that Mr. Guzman was on the premises for whatever reason, we have no evidence that he was there unlawfully. So it, uh, there's a blank, but the control of the incident is, I think, a violation of the rule and the consequent circumstances that led to these serious injuries. So I would find violations of uh, Rule 3.12 and Rule 4.16. What I didn't say on the record, but what I am certain was in my head, was the fact that prior to this and not long before this, the Court of Appeals in the Board of Liquor License Commissioners for Baltimore City versus Stephen Kugel, 451 Maryland 507, a 2017 decision, had um, read rules with almost identical language um, over the issue of control to say that there was no knowledge component to them and that the court was imposing strict liability with respect to the incident. I mean, I remember this case a bit, and it was, there was a bit of an enigma about why the young man was there, how he got in, whether he had come in with others just to eat, why he was still there at, at that late in the night and whatever, and none of those questions were answered. Uh, for me, the issue came down to whether or not there essentially was strict liability on the part of the licensees because uh, these very serious incidents had occurred on their premises, uh, even though they were um, difficult to explain and there, there was never any motivation determined for it or anything else. But that was the basis for my ruling. So um, I let the other commissioners speak for themselves. I'll, I'll let Commissioner Greenfield speak. I wasn't yeah. a part of the original yeah. ruling. I, I too f uh, find, uh, I still find, uh, violations of Rule 3.12, general welfare, and Rule 4.16 legal conduct, really based upon the following. Um, that they, and specifically that, that they failed to control the incident. Um, I'll refer to the transcript pages if I, if I could. Uh, Agent Chris Amalis asked the head of security how a 17-year-old got inside at 1.40 a.m. The response was he might have been there eating, but they, and that they do a good job making sure everyone over 21 is in the, in the bar after the kitchen closes, that they're not there. Um, page 17, they didn't, the licensee didn't, um, but for this lapse, the situation in the in the bar wouldn't have occurred. Mr. DePino testified on uh, page 25. It was a slower night. Why didn't they check IDs then after the kitchen closed? I could draw an inference, and I did then. I do now that they should have they should have checked IDs once the kitchen closed. Mr. DePino testified uh, on page 26 that the security company had five guards present that night. Five guards on a slow night. Uh, he also testifies that they didn't know who the, how the perpetrator got into the bar. Uh, Mr. Dunlap on page 45 doesn't know um, how he got into the premises, Mr. Guzman either. Um, uh, let's see. Mr. DePino on page 66 um, says there is a process for the security company to recard people once the kitchen closes at 10.30 or 11. PM. He doesn't know on page 67 if Mr. Guzman was carded. Um, but on page 66, he says they're making changes to protocol, scanners, 
That suggests to me and suggested then that they dropped the ball. Um, and Mr. DePino on page 70 <coughs> testifies that after the kitchen closes, minors aren't allowed in, but if present, if present when kitchen closes, they're not thrown out, which is in direct conflict to the earlier testimony uh, on page 17. Uh, so for those reasons, with respect to Rule 3.12, that the licensee shall operate their establishment in, an, in a manner so as not to disturb the peace, safety, health, quiet, and promote general welfare of the community, my uh, decision then and my decision now is that but for the licensee's lapse in protocol and inconsistent practice, this 17-year-old would not have been on the premises uh, and committed the, the alleged act that he did. And with respect to Rule 4.16, similarly, um, uh, I would find that and found then that this, uh, that this was in direct violation of our rules of state law um, uh, and directly against the public peace, safety, welfare, quiet, or morals when you have a 17-year-old in a licensed establishment after 1.40 a.m. who happens to be stabbing individuals. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to see, uh, I don't know if we should address the other commissioner's statement. Commissioner Peterson Moore said she concurred in the finding of a violation of Rule 3.12 and a violation of 4.16. She finds a violation of 3.02 with respect to cooperation. I don't know. I guess that was charged. Um, uh, because what the testimony is knowingly or unknowingly, there was an effort to rid the scene of blood evidence. Oh, that was what it was. That was a, she did, that was not found. Ultimately. Commissioner Moore found but a not, violation, but, but the, the other two did not. Did not. Yeah. It was just the um, 4.16. Right. Um, so that's really all she tells us, uh, that she sort of concurs. I mean. I was somewhat sympathetic to you folks then, and I am now that uh, nobody wanted this incident to occur, and it just popped up and happened. But I think under the controlling law, it was your responsibility. Um, so I would stand by my original determination. But I if you want to add anything to the record, Mr. Previs, you're welcome to do so. Thank you. I just, I just want to address Commissioner Greenfield's logic for the record and then um, ask the board to reconsider the the sanction in light of the time and the timing uh, that this occurs on. So we modified our original ruling, so we modified the monetary, the monetary uh, sanction only. down. And the, two the of the commissioners had found a suspension for what period? 14 days. Okay. Commissioner Moore and Commissioner Greenfield with, I believe, Chairman uh, indicating that a fine was appropriate but not a sanction. When Commissioner Greenfield uh, indicated that he thought 14 days was appropriate, uh, Commissioner Moore said, oh, <laughs> and then and then concurred with him. Um, well, let me just ask before you go there. Do you still feel that way? There's uh, six days left. I, Hold on. Hold on. Go ahead. Uh, would you say there's six days left? Yeah. Uh, of the suspension? Of the 14 days. The 14. What, what had occurred was I filed a motion to reconsider. Uh, that was denied. I then filed an appeal with a request for stay that was granted on the Friday after the hearing, so it was eight days served. We stayed into contact. it. Yeah. Yeah. So there are six days left, and we, we request I, that that be. I would concur with the chairman at this stage that we keep it at the fine. Thank you. Do you want to put anything else on the record? Yeah, I, just for the the, the Kugel argument, um, and I'll use the hypothetical. If I were in Banditos with my um, ten-year-old daughter. Um, she is t t legally entitled to be at Bandito's, and I can eat some really good tacos with her there. The fact that she's in there does not make the jump to that she is going to be violent. Although she's got a temper. <laughs> um, she's now 21, but I always used her in my examples for I'm sure apple. she's grateful too. Yeah. A anyway, <laughs> no, I um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just saying that the 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 fact that Mr. Guzman was underage and in the premises does not make the leap to that he is going to be violent. Um, my point was, and the the standard operating procedure 3.05 of the of the board in section 4A I in indicates 
in the bolded language that the, that the licensee would be charged if there is a relevant and weighty nexus between the operation of the establishment and the alleged violations. So if, if everybody was cleared out of the place, this incident wouldn't have happened, yes. Um, the, the individual was legally entitled to be there. Um, other counties have different rules, but Baltimore City does not with regard to um, persons under 21 in a, in a premises um, after a certain point. Um, but th their fine restaurants with BD7 licenses in the city. Um, I understand, Mr. Uh, my only point in response to that is had, had, um, had the establishment and the security actually done what it claimed that it did, maybe we wouldn't have had uh, someone stabbing people inside the bar. Right. And so, to me, that that is a significant factor. But I agree. I um, and with I don't know your ten your twenty one year old, but I know kids have tempers. But I mean, my ten year old doesn't carry carry a knife. But um, at least that I'm aware of. Uh, <laughs> maybe behind my back. So, uh, <laughs> so that, that's my only. You know, that's my only response. There was a protocol that was supposed to be in place. It wasn't followed. But for that, we wouldn't be here. Does your client want to put something brief on the record? No, I mean, just to that, to that, um, we've gone above and beyond. Um, we have a new security company called Former Military, um, substantially more expensive at $30 an hour to 15 or 20 compared to everyone else in the neighborhood. Um, a lot of those managers and people are no longer with us at this point in time. Um, so I just wanted to let you all know that we are doing as much as we can to remedy the situation I'm a very active person in the neighborhood. I'm on the board with Main Street and the business associations. Um, and I just wanted to let you guys know that we have done our best to right the situation at this time. Yeah, it was an unfortunate incident. Uh, it is, and, and, and it uh, is our responsibility too. You're right. I think the law finds that, so that's why I went that way. But thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, I believe that's our morning docket. Mr. Akras? Yes, it is. Board will be in recess until um, how about 130? 130. Are there any did, did we pay that yeah. fine? I just can't remember. It's been so off the record, Mr. Off the, off the record. Off the record. On the record. In the 1 p.m. case, Angel Lyles and Christopher Nawazi, Anato Group, LLC Trainers Oxygen Lounge, 10 South Calvert Street, Class B, Beer Wine and Liquor License. Violation of Labor and Employee Article 9 through 10, 12, Suspension of License or Permit. Anyone wishing to testify, please raise your right hand. For the record, I'm Melvin J. Kanensky representing the uh, Oxygen Lounge. And Good Maria Nakos Saxon representing the Uninsured Employers Fund. Good yes, it's Maria Nakos, N A C O S hyphen Saxon, S A X O N. And would this gentleman raise his right hand, please? Are you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Okay, and this is a, uh, ch they're charged with a uh, suspension of license or permit on April 26, 2018, admission or denial? No, we have resolved the issue, and I think Correct. they want to dismiss them. Um, oh, okay. They're charged. They being? Yes, the UEF is in agreement. Oh, okay. So, um, any objection? I, I don't object. So, they, the, 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 um, Benefits have been paid, or yes, the benefits have been paid. There's a, an award that has been paid, and there, um, the gentleman who owns the Oxygen Lounge has entered into a promissory note, and in this note, the UEF has agreed to forbearance and payment. And so, since the payment is being made, I think that we're in agreement that this could be dismissed. Correct. So There's that some third, third party third party liability here that probably would bore you if we told you about it, but right. I would, because it's inviting Geico. In 15 minutes, you can get a better rate from GEICO. So my understanding of the statute is that we had, so explain to me, because this is the first case I've seen yes. of this kind, mm -hmm. that we were required to suspend. And you're saying in lieu of a, of a resolution, the statute doesn't apply? No, certainly not. Not that the statute doesn't apply. We, we agree that it can be dismissed at this point since uh, the gentleman who owns the Oxygen Lounge is entered into an agreement to pay all everything that has been all right. accrued at this point. Thank you. 
Okay. Hearing no objections, it will be dismissed. Thank you. We were ready to try this thing like, for three hours, and the gentleman behind us all came down here from the UAF and all that. They thought they were going to get camera time. Larry would have been happy. They can bring him up. And they can get <laughs> Maybe they're, you want to see any of your relatives say hello for the holidays? All right. Yeah. I got to go. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you. Let it close it for the record. What is it, one? Claims dated 8-28-2018 from Uninsured Employee Fund. Exhibit number two, claim dated September 14, 2018 from an uninsured employee fund. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we wanted to uh, clarify on the record. Yeah. Can you recall the um, case, the last case we did this morning, please? Sure. Life around? No, uh, um, that was Banditos. Banditos. I'm sorry. We call in the case of Andrew Dunlop and Michael White, Sobo Taco Spot LLC trained as Banditos, 11 18 South Charles Street, Unit 101, Class BD7 B1 liquor license. Thank you. We're just recalling this case to clarify for the record that uh, at the end of the hearing, uh, we had had a discussion about the sanctions in the case. And as a result of a, a motion to reconsider, the monetary sanctions had been reduced to $500 from their original 1000 or $3,000. Uh, there had also, the board had originally imposed a 14-day suspension, and um, eight days of it was served before Council was able to get that stayed uh, and back before us today requested that the remaining six days uh, of the suspension be um, dismissed and um, uh, Commissioner Greenfield had indicated that he agreed with that and I uh, am agree with it as well and I think I, Commissioner Hafey is in agreement as well so yes. for the record the, those six days uh, no longer have to be complied with. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. I'm going to call this one. <laughs> Next case. I will apologize for my tardiness, sir. Mm hmm. Thank you. the first case of the afternoon docket. Second case. Second case? We've already done that. Okay. Ruchar Bahain Parikh and Naima Pliva. Saruni Incorporated, trading as Fireside North, 2201 West North Avenue. It's a class BD7 beer wine liquor license, a violation of Rule 4.01A, sales to minors. Um, before you go there, uh, Mr. Akris, the uh, Shea Joey case needs to be postponed. Okay. Do you have a copy of the revised docket? It was postponed on the revised docket. Do we, we're not going to announce it on the record? I will. Uh, yes, that's Ernest ha Hatmaker and Bradley Simmons, Shea Joey LLC, trading as uh, Shea Joey, 415 East Lombard Street, Class BD7 beer wine liquor license, multiple violations on the alcoholic beverage license and adult entertainment license. This matter has been postponed. will be reset for a future date. Thank you. Okay, returning to the Fireside North. Uh, thank you. Peter Previs on behalf of Fireside North Saruni, Inc. Okay. Uh, can all those who are going to testify raise their right hands, please? Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So this is a sale to minor uh, charge on September 25, 2018. It's an admission. Okay. Do you wish to um, give us mitigation? Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with me today is as Ms. Ruchira, Ruchira Bahen Parik, uh, one of the licensees. Ms. Nema Pliva, the other is a city resident. Um, she's Ms. Parik is the owner. Um, on the evening of this occasion, uh, the clerk, Mr. Pradeen Gurung, um, he admitted that he just dropped the ball and did not um, ask for identification from the cadet. Um, since that occurred, um, Ms. Parikh has made sure that he knows better by, instead of firing him, requiring him to get his alcohol awareness certificate, which she had uh, texted to me. Um, and that was done on, let's see, actually August 19th. So he's He's now alcohol properly. certified? Yeah. And how many employees do you have, ma'am? 
three? Mm -hmm. Have the others alcohol certified as well? Yeah, everybody's. Okay, and um, okay, uh, and you've had this license just since May, is that correct? Right. We are the new owner, so yeah. Yeah. Okay. We were we were here um, back in November. In November, with regard to a, um, a BB7 tavern issue, which was also an admission, and that that issue has uh, similarly been rectified. Um, th this th there's there's no arguing about this. This gentleman just dropped the ball, and we thought it was appropriate to counsel him and uh, educate him as opposed to firing him. And we certainly hope that nothing of this sort is going to happen okay. anytime in the near future, and hopefully, if at all. Commissioners have questions? I don't have any questions. Okay. Um, were they cooperative? Yeah. All right. Thank you. On the basis then of the materials contained in the charging documents, the proffer from counsel, the admission, and the testimony, um, I would find a violation of Rule 4.01, small a, on September 25, 2018. Mr. Chairman, I think we have someone who. Oh, yeah. yes, sir. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Marvin Cheatham. I'm the neighborhood president, Matthew Henson Neighborhood Association, doing business as Matthew Henson CDC. Uh, this is the second time we've been here in about two months. Uh, the last time was basically having a, a liquor establishment and not opening it. One of the concerns that we have, and we've been here on a couple of occasions, uh, is the lack of concern that we are seeing from liquor establishments. Uh, they come before you. Uh, you do what is appropriate. We are the neighborhood association maybe six years ago that got the fines doubled because we're finding it to be a slap on the wrist. There's no accident that two of the communities, two of the neighborhoods, both whether they're in the Western District or Southwestern District, have seen record numbers of homicides. Uh, the homicides are in the same area where there are alcohol establishments. We think that we're gonna go back to the Maryland General Assembly to get the fines increased even more because if all we're gonna do is see them get fined, and we know that our young people are drinking, uh, we think if you come to these uh, liquor establishments on a regular basis, unfortunately, you're going to see that oftentimes they will be selling to minors. It has to stop. And if they find seemingly are not well enough, I've been back in the neighborhood now six years. Every liquor store we have has been fined at least once for selling liquor to children. And we're saying there's no accident that we have the kind of violence and crime that we have in neighborhoods where liquor is allowed to be sold to children. This is a new business. They shouldn't be having these kind of problems. They need to be more actively involved in the community. So maybe a relationship with the community will let them know they have to it, train their uh, employees well enough to know that it is awful to sell liquor to children. And if they actually went to the store once a month, they would probably catch the majority of our liquor stores. We have 14, 14 liquor stores in one small community. We're inundated with crime and violence. We need stronger punishment. We need some more directive coming from this board, talking to these owners about one, developing a relationship with the community. And then also making certain that these violations not just be slapped on our wrist. We're going to see if we can get the fines doubled again, as we did about six years ago. But how, what does the community do when you have so many liquor stores and they all violate the selling to youth? So we appreciate the opportunity, but something more has to be done. Right now, I think the Southwestern Police District, the Western Police District are fighting neck and neck as to who's going to have the largest number of homicides. Right now, we both have 47. And we don't think it's an accident that has something to do with alcohol and drugs. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, commissioners have anything? Okay. Um, I found a violation of Rule 4.01, small a, on September 25, 2018. I'd impose a thousand dollar fine and give you 30 days to pay. I too find a violation of Rule 4.01, a, sales to minors, on September 25, 2018. And given that this is the uh, second violation within a couple of months of each other, uh, although the first one was a BD7 violation, this licensee has had the um, has this has had an establishment since May uh, so I am inclined to go a little bit higher to 1500 for this offense Mr. Akers can we go more than a since this is a second offense can we 
go over a thousand? You can go up to three thousand. I find a violation of Rule 4.01A, sales to minors. Um, since this is the second offense in, in um, three months, um, I will concur with uh, Commissioner Hafey for a uh, fine of $1,500. Okay, um, fine will be $1,500 with the administrative cost 30 days to pay. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. All right, call exhibits for the record. Board Exhibit 1, Baltimore City Police Department Report, Detective Greenhill. Board Exhibit 2, Investigation Report, Agent Chris Amalis. Thank you. Calling the next case, Russell M. Schaefer Jr., Island House Incorporated, trading as Island House Bar and Grill, 4330 East Lombard Street, is a class BD7 beer, wine, and liquor license. A violation of Alcoholic Beverages Article 12-2102C, nudity and sexual displays, Violation of Rule 4.15B, Sexual Practices and Obscenity, and a violation of Rule 4.10, False Statements. Council. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Peter Previs on behalf of the licensee. Mr. Schaefer was just here, but he had to get the work over at the police department. Um, Mr. Um, Spence is uh, here today, and he's the We've had a transfer application that's been approved, but it has not been totally completed, and Mr. Spence was there on the evening of this occasion. Okay, can I ask all those who are going to testify to raise their right hands, please? Uh, you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. So uh, there are three violations charged on November 11, 2018. Are any of them going to be admitted? Yes, the, the alcoholic beverage 122102C uh, is admitted, the Rule 4.15B is admitted. It, it denies the Rule 4.10 false statement. I believe that was more of a, 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 a lapse of understanding and not of a, an, an intentional false statement. Um, who would testify on behalf of this last violation? I will. Okay, uh, Inspector, please come forward. Agent Chris Malice, Baltimore City Liquor Board. On that date, uh, we send in Inspector uh, Chase with uh, money that was provided by the Baltimore City Police Department to buy alcohol and to pay cover. She went and she paid cover charge at the door, went in, ordered alcoholic beverage. That's how we went in for the adult entertainment. When we went in, I asked him if he knew that he needed an adult entertainment license to have strippers. He said it was a private party. I said, what do you mean by private party? He said tickets were sold in advance uh, to people that they knew and that you could not, he said, you cannot buy a ticket at the door, uh, which was a false statement, because obviously, I'm hoping Inspector Chase had purchased a ticket prior to the investigation. Okay, um, thank you. You have questions for him, Mr. Priva? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chris Amalis, it was, it, it had, it's already been admitted that there was a, um, a, a, a adult male strippers and an act that was going on on that occasion and that this this establishment does not have a license for adult entertainment um, the mr. Spence indicated to you that it was a private party correct he said it's a private party now the the entire premises what was the show going on in the entire premises or what is in a uh, separate room it was in a separate room so when you go they ask you are you here for the show if you're here for the show you pay cover and you go in the back room if you're not there for the show you go into the main bar okay so so in the, the main bar was open to the public there was no adult entertainment that's correct observable from fr from the from the main bar that's correct okay D did you understand mr. Spence to mean that the it was private in that the entire establishment was not, did not have a, a show going on? No, I, I specifically asked him, can somebody off the street come and come into this, to this venue? And he said, absolutely not. Okay, but somebody, but the, the inspector did That's correct. walk in with it and paid a $15 fine. Correct, well I don't know the amount, it's in her report. Okay. Thank you, I have no further questions. Okay, uh, do you wish to present any evidence? Yeah. Mr. Spence, were, were you sworn? Yes. Okay. State your name for the record. Sure. Clint Spencer. Good afternoon. I'm sorry. Spencer. Clint Spencer. C-L-I-N-T. 
Okay. M Mr. Spencer, you were on duty that evening? Yes, I was. Sunday night? Yes. Okay. And there was a, 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 a performance of three adult male strippers? That's correct, in the rear room. Okay. And you, you, your, the premises is authorized for live entertainment? Yes, it is. And you thought that live entertainment included that's correct. adult entertainment? I, I assume that. And you found out that that's not the case. That's is that correct. right? That's correct. Have you allowed any adult entertainment on your premises not since anymore. this occurred? Not okay. Anymore, you you yes, have no. been counseled and you understand and you have admitted to that violation. Is yes. that correct? Correct. Okay. Mr. Uh, Agent C Inspector Chris Amalis uh, has indicated that you provided a false statement to him. Do you uh, feel that you that you misled him in any way? No, sir. I told him what was told to me that it was a private event as nobody purchasing tickets or coming in purchasing getting in the room. It was told it had to be bought online or through some one of the promoters. Okay, so the, the this you didn't hire the three individuals, mm. someone else did that? No, I didn't. Okay, and it was your understanding that that would be all done not at the front door? That's correct. Okay, um, but the inspector has indicated that she did buy a ticket at the front door. How do you explain that? Well, I can't dispute that. Um, sometimes I'm outside of the premises because there's sometimes some people in the neighborhood like to hang out or come in the bar. So I kind of stand outside sometimes just to make sure some of the neighborhood kids doesn't come near the bar. And that's when the officers also actually pulled up and I was outside smoking cigarettes. Did you feel that you misled Mr. Uh, Inspector Chris Amalis in any way? No, I didn't. Okay. Thank you. I have nothing Anything further. else? Uh, no. Commissioners have any questions? I don't have any questions. No questions. Okay. Thank you. On the basis of the materials contained in the charging documents, the um, proper admissions from counsel as well as the testimony, I find a violation of alcoholic beverages, Article 12-2102, small c, on November 11, 2018 a violation of Rule 4.15b on November 11, 2018, and a violation of Rule 4.10 um, on November 11, 2018. Um, I'd impose a $500 fine as to each for a total of $1,500 plus administrative costs. I'd give them 30 days to pay. I, too, find a violation of 12-2102, um, uh, excuse me, violation of alcohol beverage article 12-2102C on November 11, 2018. Find a violation of rule 4.15B on November 11, 2018 and a violation of rule 4.10 on November 11, 2018 and I concur with the imposition of a $500 fine as to each violation. I find a violation of alcoholic beverages article 12-2102C and would concur with the imposition of a $500 fine. I also find a violation of rule 4.15B uh, and would concur with the imposition of a $500 fine. I find a violation of rule 4.10 uh, on November 11, 2018 and would also find, uh, would also concur with the imposition of a $500 fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's close this for the record. Board of Exhibit 1, Baltimore City Police Department Report, Detective Gatto. Board of Exhibit 2, Investigation Report, Agent John Chris Amalis. Board of Exhibit 3, Investigation Report, Inspector Chase. Thank you. Calling next case, Jason Munoz and Marilyn Munoz, El Rincón Trancaleno, LLC, trading as El Rincón Trancaleno, 422-26 South Macon Street. It's a Class B beer, wine, and liquor license, a violation of Rule 3.12 General Welfare, and a violation of Rule 4.16 Illegal Conduct. Uh, would those who are going to testify raise their right hands, please? Swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Are you Mr. Munoz, sir? Yes. So you've been charged with um, a violation of Rule 3.12 with respect to the loud music on October 27th and a violation of Rule 4.16 um, also related to the loud music on October 27, 2018. Do you wish to admit or deny those violations? Yeah, yeah, I got it. You will admit them? 
Yeah, and I want to say something too. Um, like if this gentleman was there a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago. I'm sorry, I was, I'm, I was out of the country. So my wife, she doesn't know about to run the business. So I apologize about that. Because I told you I don't was here, I was out of the country. So I'll be back last week. So, and then my wife gave it to me the, the, uh, the warning, like uh, the gentleman gave it to me. Um, so, Mr. Fossler, how are you today? I'm good, Chairman. Thank you. Good. Um, so, do you want to fill us in a little bit about this? Okay, yes, sir. Um, Mark Fossler, Chief Inspector, Baltimore City Liquor Board. Uh, we had, uh, I was working uh, 311 complaints on Saturday, October 27th, uh, and received a complaint about loud music at this establishment. Uh, because we, in the past, we have responded to this com this establishment for uh, loud noise, loud music. In the past, uh, I parked a, a, a little bit up the street at the intersection of uh, uh, Macon and uh, Eastern Avenue. And uh, the, uh, from my position parked, which is approximately, I was maybe 70 yards away from the front of the establishment, I could clearly hear the music. And the closest uh, residential property to this establishment is uh, right next door. So if I could hear it from 70 yards away, that there clearly a disturbance. And we have in the past advised the licensee to turn the music down. And in the past, he's always been very cooperative about turning the music down, but we continue to have to go back. So on this he occasion- He was not there that evening, is that correct? No, sir. His wife was there? Um, I oh. talked to a manager there. Oh, okay. okay. Sir. All right. Um, I understand. So th th the concern is that it continues even though you've had the problem before. Yes, sir. Okay. Commissioners have questions? No questions. No questions. Anything you want to add, sir? No. Yeah. Uh, not sure. I want to say, like, uh, last time to the same gentleman, somebody called to over there about to my trash can, too, and he knows about that. And when he got over to my place, the trash can was very clear. I tried to keep my place, everything clear. Try to be able to put security, too. So I tried to be run very well the business. So I'm three years old in the business, but I try to work well with you guys. So. I'm sorry if you do mistakes. I'm sorry. I told you I other was here. I was out of the country. If but you, you hear what Mr. Fossler is saying is that this happens more than once. So the music is a problem, and you've got yeah, to do so something I with control that. control too with my people. I spoke with my people already. So try to put the regular volume. Okay. Um, thank you. On the basis of the materials contained in the charging documents and the testimony received, I find a violation of Rule 3.12 on October 27, 2018, as well as a violation of Rule 4.16 on October 27, 2018. Um, his license he's had since May of 2017. He's got two sales to minors before this. I'd oppose, uh, impose a $1,000 fine as to each for a total of $2,000, and I'd give him 30 days to pay. I, too, find a violation of Rule 3.12 on October 27, 2018, and violation of Rule 4.16 on October 27, 2018, and I concur with the imposition of a uh, 500 fine. 500 a, a thousand as to each, I said. Excuse me. A thousand as to each violation for a total of 2,000. I find a violation of Rule 3.12 and would concur with the imposition of a thousand dollar fine. I also find a violation of Rule 4.16 and would concur with the imposition of a thousand dollar fine. Okay, be careful, sir. Thank you. Okay, sir. Here you go, sir. I pause it, sir. I pause it for the record. What is it? Is it the one? Investigation for it? Chief Inspector Foster. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pre uh, Akris, is that our docket? Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, that is our docket. Uh, the board is in recess until December 13th, 2018. Thank you.